Okay. Can you hear me in the back? Can you can you hear me in the back? Good. Okay, guys. Um, couple uh, quick items. First of all, how many of you finish MP0, MP1? Very good. You can continue to submit, and if you want to change anything, you can just continue to make changes and submit. Okay, we'll just take the last one. And if you make a mistake, after you, uh, you make the changes and so on, make sure that you uh, submit whatever is correct as your final, final submission, okay? So you can do whatever you want, and just make sure that the final last submission you make is the correct one, okay? Um, second, uh, the second question is, how many of you were able to watch the class video from last week? Okay, they should be available through the wiki, and they also uh, available through the 360, uh, Echo 360 uh, site. Um, for those of you who are in Chicago, um, I'm going to be starting to travel to Chicago for this class next week. So for the Illinois campus cl class, you're going to see some streaming lectures uh, from next week on. So we're going to be doing some flip-flopping between Illinois and Chicago um, campuses. So hopefully it will be a reasonable experience. I wanted to work out some of the kinks before I start to do that, but um, uh, let's see how it goes, okay? Um, how many of you are still waiting to get into the uh, class? Okay, um, this is something that um, uh, historically we never have to do this, but um, uh, this is the first semester I truly don't know if I can get everyone in anymore. Um, we are oversubscribed and uh, uh, subscribed and also um, we don't know how many will give up their seats. So let me offer a deal here. For those of you, uh, you may, this may sound familiar if you take uh, airline flights often. So for those of you who have some flexibility in taking this class, um, if you want to take the class in fall of 2018, we will guarantee you a seat, okay? And uh, so if you, uh, if you come to me and say, you know what, I have some flexibility, I'm getting a little bit busy on my schedule, I, uh, but I want to make sure that I have a seat available to me in fall of 2018, I'll personally guarantee you you have a seat in 2018, okay? And if you need a recommendation letter from me in the future, I'll guarantee you a recommendation letter, okay? <laughs> I don't guarantee a good letter, <laughs> But I'll guarantee you a letter, okay? So um, the, you know, the quality of letter obviously will be, uh, will be dependent on your, uh, you know, your academic performance, right? So uh, please uh, let me know if you want to give up your seat and uh, you know, I'll make sure that you get that, uh, those, both guarantees um, in fall of 2018, okay? Uh, let's try to get everyone who want to take this course before they graduate into the course. I, I know that there are quite a few of you who are graduating this semester, so I'm really trying to get everyone in who need to take the course before they graduate, okay? So uh, be nice, you know, be good, and also be good to yourself, okay? You're going to have, you know, personal guarantee from me. So the, I, I said this on video, okay? So I cannot take the, you know, go back on my words, okay? Okay, so um, this, is, this is the class, um, you know, wiki, and I want to make sure that everyone knows that you should be uh, constantly looking at the class wiki as well as the piazza, okay? And um, uh, one of the things that you should notice is that the TA office hours, I'll get, uh, make sure that Kevin posts his hours soon, but um, uh, we still have one more office hour today, uh, 1 to 3 p.m. So for those of you who still need some help, with the lab before the deadline tomorrow, this is the time, okay? So make sure that you take advantage of TA office hours. Um, the TA office hours tend to be underutilized at the beginning of the semester. So the, you know, just, just you know, take advantage of it, okay? And I also have an office hour this afternoon at 1.30, so you know, if you want to come and you know, uh, tell me how eager you are to give up your seats, or uh, I don't know, you're not uh, required to do that, or you want to just introduce yourself and you know, talk about uh, what you expect from this course, 
you're more than welcome to come. Okay, so you know what? We'll have a you know, we usually have a small but you know nice discussion uh, during these office hours. So today we're going to have a lot of work to do. So uh, last time we introduced the CUDA APIs. Okay, the very basic APIs: allocate memory, transfer data, and launch kernels. And we'll also talk about how you can associate each thread using the thread index and a block index with the data, right? So we, we, we did this I expression that linked the thread index and block index into the data index. And that's what we call the thread assignment. We assign threads to some data and therefore the work associated with data. So this is you know, very, very typical of data parallelism. Today we're going to uh, go into some of the details that you will know what you're doing because some of the uh, things that we taught uh, on last Thursday was more of an abstraction. Okay, there's quite a bit of abstraction involved. It's an API function, you say, okay, we're going to create so many threads, so, so many thread blocks, and we're going to assign some of these thread uh, indices into a data index, that's great. But there are a few things under the hood that you need to understand just so that um, you, you know what you're really doing when you tell the hardware you know, to do certain things through these APIs. So the mental image I would like you to, to have, uh, how many of you have watched the um, cartoon uh, from Disney, Fantasia? How many of you, Fantasia? Oh my, okay. <laughs> Okay, we need to talk. <laughs> As engineers, there are a few things you need to know. Okay, let me try again. How many of you have, have watched the movie Fantasia from Disney? Your parents didn't do, your, do their job. Okay, many, many Disney movies are not so great, okay? But that particular movie has a lot of value for parallel programming, <laughs> okay? And there is a scene in that movie where Mickey Mouse, with that hat, was conducting. And then there were these, you know, big waves from the ocean, there are all kinds of, you know, big events going on. That's exactly what parallel programming is about. You're the conductor. You're going to be using APIs to cause these huge waves and these huge activities, okay? And you need to know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, you're creating disasters, okay? When you can move so much resource, so much execution power to work on certain data, you can also quickly create disasters if you're not careful. And sometimes you may have a situation where you try to create a huge wave and then you ding, and nothing happens. And that's where you need to understand some of the hood, you know, under the hood mechanisms to make, to make sure that you really know what you're doing so that when you say, let there be wave, there will be a huge wave coming, okay? So that's something that you should also do this weekend. Um, go online, look for the movie Fantasia, make sure that you watch that scene so that you have the mental image for parallel programming through the semester. Now, the objective of this lecture is for you to learn more about the logical multidimensional organization of CUDA threads, okay? You have seen vector addition, and that's the Hello World version, you know, the uh, GPU version of Hello World. And uh, you need to learn in this lecture how to use control structures like loops and, you know, um, uh, decisions like if and else and loops in the kernels. And then uh, you, will, you will know that for programming these threads, even though you're programming massive uh, number of them, it's fundamentally not that different from a typical program you write for a single processor. You still need to make decisions, okay? You still need to make sure that you can loop through data structures and so on. And to learn the concept of thread scheduling, latency tolerance, and hardware occupancy, you're gonna be, for the first time, see that there is a very, very abstract concept of parallelism 
you're creating hundreds of thousands of threads, you're creating you know, thousands of thread blocks, but in the end, you have limited amount of hardware. So how do these threads and thread blocks actually get executed by real hardware? It, are all these things always executing, or they're somehow you know, uh, taking turns in a little bit of my hardware, that's what we're going to get into today. So this is a quick review of you know, what you're doing for uh, MP1. So uh, basically, this is an example that we use for processing 1,000 elements using thread block size of 256. Many of you also have asked, you know, how about if I use different block size of course you can, okay? And, but adjust the number of blocks accordingly, right? We talk about that. So if we look at the code, we see that uh, we have a uh, you know, kernel launch of vector addition, and uh, we uh, took 256 as a thread box size, and then we have n divided by 256.0 take ceiling function. You can have your own version of it. Remember, we, we talk about you can use the module, uh, modulo expression and you know so take whatever you want and you can use casting explicit casting you know whatever works for you and in the kernel we have this very important expression i this i thing is a expression that link the thread index and block index into the data index so this i is the index for the thread to find its data and you know do the work. So that, that's what uh, we see that uh, AI plus BI, you get, uh, go into CI, you know, in the kernel code. And in practice, all the threads will be executing this piece of code under a different I value because of their thread index and block index differences. So in the picture, we show this, you know, uh, example where you have thread block zero, thread block one, thread block two, and um, there should be four of them, right? So we had dot, 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 and then the last one. And we show that, you know, the first uh, thread block zero will cover I from zero to 255. And the second block will cover from 256 to 511. The last one, the last thread block will cover from 768 to uh, 999, right? So those are the the things that we already talked about. So one of the things that uh, you should notice is that uh, you know, well, we're going to begin to, you know, to, to, to look at how we can vary some of these things because we have total programmability of these GPUs. Okay? So uh, we actually can begin to have variations of these things into, you know, and, uh, so that you can understand uh, that when we write a piece of program, we can uh, do all kinds of variations. So here is a very, very simple variation, but it turned out that this is a very uh, important pattern for something like this uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, processing a linear data structure uh, in practice. So um, if you have finished MP1, you will know that we have a question about what if we assign each thread to process two elements? There's no fundamental reason why each thread has to process only one element. So we said, okay, you know, let's get each thread to process two elements because in the end, generating a thread, okay, maintaining a thread still has a little bit of overhead. So if we spend the overhead to generate that thread, we may as well have that thread to process, you know, maybe do more work, process more elements. And um, so here, uh, we see that uh, we're going to use two thread blocks and still 256 of those elements to process the thousand um, you know, data elements. And um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have each thread to process two elements. So each thread block is going to process 512 elements. We still have 256 threads. So a very simple way to do this is that you can just have the thread block zero to start with zero and thread block one to start at uh, uh, 200, uh, uh, thread block one to, to, to start with 500 and uh, it's actually, there's a typo, it should, shouldn't be 768, it should be 511. So um, basically, thread z block zero and thread block one 
will do just like what they did in your code and process 256 uh, elements. However, thread block one does not start with 256, it starts at 512, okay? Now, after the, the first step, we will move every thread in the thread block zero to the next section, okay? So this time, every thread in the thread, uh, thread box zero is going to process one more element starting from 256 to 511. And thread block one also does the same thing. Thread block one moves to 768, and then everyone process uh, 256 elements. So if we look at the kernel code, what we need to do is we, we have I, instead of uh, having I to have to be calculated as block dim times block uh, index, we multiply that uh, term, term by two because now every thread block is going to process two times the amount of work. So if you think about the beginning location of work for every thread, they're going to be shifted by a, the, uh, you, you're going to have every other block of data covered by the thread blocks in the first step, and then they all move to the neighboring one to, uh, to finish the next one. Obviously, this doesn't have to end here. You could have multiple, you know, each thread block to process even more data segments. So you could easily be writing a for loop rather than having these, you know, increment and then another piece of code. You can just do a for loop or you do a while loop. And we're going to see some of that um, in the, uh, you know, the uh, histogram calculation and so on. So uh, there are also pros and cons about how we cover these thread uh, data sections with thread blocks. You can actually have every thread block to still cover continuous number of uh, segments, and then everyone move to a huge step and process another continuous segment, number of segments, right? So, you know, I want to make sure that you understand at this point, there's no religion in whatever you need to do to process all the elements. There are m multiple ways, and you should experiment. If you, you know, give, uh, given any uh, available time, you should be uh, experimenting with these alternatives because all these things will help you to, you know, to, uh, to become a stronger uh, programmer uh, later on during the semester. So that's linear. So we're going to uh, begin to get into the multidimensional uh, aspect of these indices. I think someone last time asked me, you know, why do you have multidimensional uh, block index and uh, uh, thread index? You know, so this is, uh, I promise a longer answer. So this is actually the beginning of that longer answer. So CUDA thread grids are multidimensional. So the thread index and block index are actually multidimensional variables. We saw the use of X, and you can also use Y and Z. So uh, here we show a very, very small example where uh, the thread blocks, uh, the, uh, the thread indices in the thread block are three-dimensional. So we have the uh, thread, we have the X in, uh, dimension, and we have the Y dimension, and we have the, uh, the Z dimension. So uh, X, Y, and then Z dimension. So these are the, uh, the dimensions of uh, thread indices. So we, if we have uh, a four, uh, uh, four by two by two uh, three-dimensional block, and this is the logical uh, illustration of that uh, thread block. So the eight threads will be in this index, index with X, Y, Z accordingly. Now, in this example, we're also showing that the thread blocks are indexed with two-dimensional indices. So the thread blocks can be X and Y. And what I'm showing here is the block index may have different dimension, number of dimensions as the uh, thread index. You don't have to have exactly the same thing. This is all the flexibility you have in order to be able to manage your data structure and give you, the, you know, all the uh, power you need in order to program uh, your, for your data structure. So here, let's go into a two-dimensional case. 
um, you know, we went through the vector addition, and now uh, let's uh, look at a very natural two-dimensional data structure, images. Right? The, the, uh, the pictures and images are two-dimensional um, you know, uh, data, uh, data. So uh, let's say if we want to process a picture and uh, do the uh, color to gray scale image uh, you know, transformation, so we already have uh, talked about this last time, right? Um, and we didn't do anything about it in terms of coding, but um, we introduced the concept. So we understand RGB, right? We understand that the pixels are represented with the uh, RGB values. And um, so we also understand that these transformations can be done uh, in parallel. The pixels can be transformed independent of others. So we will be doing all the uh, transformations of all the pixels in parallel. So let's use a, a simple example. If we try to process an image of 60, uh, 76 by 62 pixels, okay, it's a fairly low resolution picture. It's you know, one of those uh, you know, sort of a small things that you can grab from the internet. A lot of these internet pictures are low res resolution pictures uh, you know, by the time they posted these uh, pictures. So um, you know, we see that uh, uh, we have uh, you know, uh, uh, 76 pixels in the y dimension, and then uh, 62, uh, actually I think it's the other way around. Um, uh, it's, the, it's 76 pixels in the x dimension, and then uh, 62 pixels in the uh, y dimension. One, two, three, four, that's correct. So then we say, uh, let's use thread blocks to cover these pixels. So uh, let's say we decided to use 16 by 16 thread blocks. Um, you can actually use up to 32 by 32 thread blocks in this case because the GPUs that you, uh, you use will be able to allow uh, 32 by 32 thread blocks and you should be uh, you know, experimenting with that. You don't even have to use a square thread block. You could use you know, um, 8 by 32 or you know, 16 by 32 or, you know, and vice versa or even uh, 16 by 64 if you want. Okay, so these are the kind of things that you should be, you know, uh, playing around. So uh, one of the things that we're going to see is that, you know, remember we only have 76 by 62 uh, two pixels, but we're using 16 by 16 thread blocks here. If you look at the coverage of thread blocks on the data, you will see that we're going to have 78. Uh, you know, the uh, 80 actually, 80 pixels in the x dimension and uh, uh, threads in the x dimension and then 64 threads in the y dimension because we're creating multiples of 16s in each dimension. So this is the quantization, okay? This is the quantization effect of CUDA API. So we're going to have four extra threads in the x dimension and two extra threads in the y dimension that are not covering any meaningful pixel, right? So when we map these threads from the thread indices to the uh, data indices, we're going to have some threads in, on each edge, okay, of each edge of the, uh, well, the grid uh, you know, organization that correspond to no pixel, okay? So we don't want them to do anything bad, right? So we already talked a little bit about that in the vector processing, but this is exactly uh, you know, what we're going to see in a two-dimensional case as well. So in the kernel, when we launch a kernel, we're going to have every thread to process one of the pixels. So we're going to be mapping the two-dimensional thread indices to the two-dimensional picture pixel indices. So it's actually extremely straightforward well, we have these two-dimensional uh, thread index capabilities. So uh, instead of you know, trying to, 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 uh, to find a complex expression, we can simply create a column index. Column index tells you which column it is in the, uh, in, in the pixel, in, in the picture, and then row index tells you which row in the picture you should be processing. So every thread, block, uh, thread in, the, uh, in the grid will be calculating its column index and its row index. And the column index and row index are formed exactly the same way as your vector addition. Because all you have to do is to make sure that you use your block index and thread index to form a linear ID for the column index 
and then you use the y dimension of your block index and thread index to form your row index. And this guarantees a complete continuous coverage of all the pixels in the picture, right? Just like the vector addition, okay? So, and then we do a quick test. We see if your column index is less than the width of the picture, and also the row index is less than the height of the picture. And that tells you that you are in the valid range of the pixel data structure. If either of your column or width are outside, is outside that range, then you should not do anything. That's why the processing, um, you know, uh, in the, for the rest of the kernel will depend on this test. Some of the threads will, most of the threads will succeed. The threads are within that range. And then some of the threads that are either at the edge of the horizontal direction or the edge of the vertical direction will not do anything because they're outside the valid data range. I saw a question. So is the kernel launch any different if you want a two dimensional grid? Yeah, so the question is, is the kernel launch any different if you want to have two dimensional grid? Um, yes, so uh, slightly. So remember, we have a second way to initialize this DIM3 data structure, and they use the DIM3 data structure to launch the kernel. So instead of using numbers now, the number launch that many of you use for vector addition is simply a shorthand. It's, it's a CUDA API feature that allows you to have a special case of one dimensional thread. So if you just use a number as a parameter, it will interpret it as number one one for the DIM3 data structure. So here, if you want to use two dimensional thread box, then you should initialize a DIM3 data structure with the num proper numbers in those the first two fields, and then one in the last field, okay? So, so this is the first part. You calculate your column index, row index with your block and thread index, and so you find that pixel, and then you, 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 say, uh, you decide whether you should be doing anything in the, uh, in the uh, uh, because you're in the valid range. Now, um, in order to really understand uh, the index in these two-dimensional arrays, you unfortunately need to understand the data layout in C. So this is one of the things that uh, you know, C programming language expose a, uh, well, uh, the data layout convention, and Fortran also you know, expose the data layout convention. Unfortunately, those, those two dimensions are different. So I know that some of you are from mechanical engineering, some of you are from chemical engineering, and so on, and because I actually had to give you overrides. So the, uh, the, uh, the interesting part is Fortran and C are opposite in, in terms of the layout convention. This is like a little Indian and big Indian. So uh, how many of you have watched the movie Gulliver's Adventures? Any version of it? Oh boy. Okay, whatever I talk about at the beginning of the class apply to this one too. Okay, so if you're busy this weekend, you know, watch it next weekend. So you know, line up your, your kind of catch up movies, okay? There are a lot of important things in these movies that you, 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 should, um, you should know when you're, you know, when you want, if you want to be a really good engineer. So, um, you know, essentially in that movie, um, you know, there's a, there's a war between the two countries because they, you know, that they insist on a, essentially something that doesn't matter, but you have two ways of doing it. So one, you know, one wants to crack the egg from the small end, and one wants to crack egg from the big end. And they cause a war between the two countries. Essentially, that's, you know, kind of what it is. And um, in our field, there are two things that uh, we also have, you know, tremendous trouble. One is, Little Indian versus Big Indian. So the, the, when you have a multi-byte data structure, uh, data, some architectures are called Little Indian arch uh, you know, architectures, and some architectures are called Big Indian arch architectures. It means that the, uh, the, uh, the least significant byte of the data go, comes in first or last in your data file, okay? And this is sufficient to make the drivers, the device drivers, to not work properly across architectures. IBM, 
is the big Indian architecture, has been the big, big Indian architecture for many years, and everyone else has been little Indian architecture for a long time. And this is the fundamental reason why it was almost impossible to get some of the drivers to work uh, across x86 and uh, IBM. So that's called the Indianness. The second one is data layout. The data layout decision, uh, we call the row major layout and uh, column major layout for two uh, dimensional or higher dimensional data structures. In C, we, call, uh, we have a row major layout. That is, if you have a two dimensional array or a matrix, uh, you will take the rows, you will take the rows of the, the matrices and make the elements of those rows consecutive in the memory. So you will place all the elements of row zero into memory first, and then you take all the elements of row one and place them into memory. So this is exactly uh, you know, uh, uh, an illustration of that process. So we have a two-dimensional matrix in C, and uh, we will take the first row, M00 through M03, and we place them into consecutive locations in the uh, memory. And then we take uh, row one, which is M10 through M13, and we put, place them into consecutive, the next consecutive locations in memory. And the row structure is preserved, because uh, all the elements that are consecutive with each other in the row will be consecutive with each other in the memory uh, layout. Okay, that's what's called row major. Fortran does the opposite. Fortran preserves the column structure. So Fortran would take the first column and then place them cons consecutively in the memory. And um, this is causes tremendous amount of trouble for people who uh, you know, are good with Fortran when they try to learn C data structure and then when uh, they are good with C and try to learn Fortran data structure. Not to mention that Fortran started with its index with one and C started the index with zero. So you know, what the, if forever, what the, you know, it's a great exercise to prevent Alzheimer's disease but you, you know, the go back and forth between Fortran and C it really is a very good mind exercise. Uh, but you, you know, try to you know, debug Fortran programs and C programs in turns. So here uh, we show that the, what we call the linearization of multidimensional arrays. So uh, the, uh, the first uh, horizontal row shows the, uh, the data layout for the two-dimensional uh, array elements. Okay, so you see that M00 is followed by M01, M02, and so on. So the, everything is laid out that way. And this, because now we have a linear storage, in reality, all the data that we have in our memory system is stored into a linear address space anyway, right? We, we have a linear address for all the data. This is the fundamental reason why pointers work the, the way they, they do. So we actually can interpret the M as an equivalent one-dimensional array. And this equivalent one-dimensional array will have M00 interpreted as M0, and M03 as M3. But then M10 becomes M4. And this is what we call a linearized index for two-dimensional arrays. Why is this important? Why am I wasting all this time talking about this when we're talking about parallel programming? Unfortunately, CUDA is a derivative of C and C++, and um, uh, the, you, it turns out that all the GPU data uh, you know, allocation are dynamically allocated, right? So we, remember, we, we do the CUDA malloc and so on. In C, we have a uh, kind of an unfortunate tradition that um, if you allocate data dynamically, yeah, it's, it's old. So uh, if you allocate uh, you know, data dynamically, uh, you actually cannot access the data using multi-dimensional syntax. You actually have to use the linearized syntax for accessing that data. There are new standards and new revisions that are trying to correct this, but many, many compilers and tools and so on are still built in that, uh, in, uh, that way. So you cannot expect your code to work, work properly across you know, standards and so on if you use multi-dimensional um, you know, notation to access a dynamically allocated 
two or three dimensional array, okay? So this is the unfortunate part of C. It's not, for, uh, it's not CUDA, it's really because CUDA was built on top of C. And you know, the CUDA front end and so on are adapted from C and C++ front ends. So that's why when we access a multi-dimensional data structure uh, in, the globe, uh, in the GPU memory, today we still need to do the linearization and form the linearized index when we access these elements. Now, so this brings us to the second part of the, um, you know, of the kernel code. So assuming that we have passed the test and uh, we know that this particular thread belongs in the region where it's within the valid range of column and row indices. So um, we're going to be forming what we call the gray offset. This is the gray image offset. Remember, we're converting from color image to grayscale image. Grayscale image means that every pixel has, is represented on, with only one value, the, the chromatic value. Okay, so there's only one brightness value for the uh, gray image. So when we form the linearized index, we're going to take the row index we're talking the, the row index, which tells us which row the pixel belongs, multiplied by the width of the picture, because that tells us how many elements you need to skip over in your linearized, uh, you know, uh, linearized layout. And then you add the column index that tells you the, in the consecutive part, uh, you know, layout in the row, which position you're going to use. So you skip over multiple rows in your linearized, you know, uh, in, uh, linearized layout, and then you uh, index into the section to find your pixel. So this is the gray index. And then the RGB offset means that you're going to be able to, 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 uh, to find the RGB pixel. And remember, RGB pixel has three values, R value, G value, and, uh, and B value. So every pixel actually takes three floating point numbers to represent. So in the data, what we're going to have is that instead of just using the, uh, you know, uh, the linearized uh, index, we need to multiply the index by three to find the real beginning point of each pixel. Each pixel will take three positions to represent. So you take the gray index, which tells you which pixel you'll be looking at, multiply by three is the number of channels. So this, you know, we may as well start to, you know, be uh, used to some of these uh, terms. And you, you will also see channels in machine learning and so on. So essentially channels means that the number of input values for each piece of information you're trying to represent. So you multiply the gray offset by number of channels that gives you the real index to be able to find the beginning position of the pixel that you're trying to find, uh, to process. So now we're going to uh, fetch the R value, the G value, and the B value by uh, taking the RGB offset and then plus zero, plus one, plus two. So these are the three consecutive locations that you use to, uh, for the RGB. And then we calculate the a expression that is given by you know, some sort of standard. So we're using the Adobe standard. And then we uh, you know, write the calculated value into the gray image, gray offset position. All these indices are calculated with block index and thread index in both the X and Y dimension, right? The column in, uh, part is calculated with the X dimension, and the, uh, the row index part is calculated with the Y dimension. So if you look at this piece of code, you will see that there is some logic. For example, when I need to test whether my pixel value is in the valid range, using these two-dimensional block index and row index, I can generate a column and row that is easy and logical to test whether I'm in the right range. And then if you need to form a real uh, linearized index, you can just do that yeah, in your code. But you can still keep track of this column value and row, uh, row value, which tells you logically which pixel that uh, you're really trying to, uh, to access. So this gives you a little bit of sanity in your code, even though you eventually need to linearize your indices. Yes, I saw a question. Sorry, can you explain the line of code with channels? Okay, so right here. Oops, of course. So, um, but remember, we have two data structures. The RGB uh, you know, color image and then the gray scale image. The 
color image has, you know, every pixel is represented by three floating point values. So channel equals three in, in this case. So channel is really just a, a constant three. So you know what, in fact, uh, we have a comment up there and say three channels corresponding to RGB, okay? So um, that's image, com uh, you know, uh, color to gray scale image conversion. It's very straightforward. Every pixel is going to be processed by one thread, right? And we have two-dimensional thread data structure to cover the two-dimensional uh, data. So now let's go into something a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, we're going to look at image blurring. So uh, you know what, we're going to you know, take an image on the left-hand side, and then we're going to blur the image a little bit by making every image value the average value of the pixels around it. Why do we do image blurring? When we, it typically, the, uh, the reason why we want to do image blurring is because we want to do down sampling of images. We often, you know, what, the, what we do is we actually make the image a little bit more smooth and then every pixel value will, will have some effect from the neighboring images. And then we only pick one sample of image out of every so many. So we essentially, you know, reduce the amount of information, uh, uh, pixels that we use to represent the picture, but we still get a good quality picture. So the way to think about image blurring is to essentially eliminate some of the fine details and so that you can get a bigger picture view, the bigger picture. So one way to think about it is if you want to have a, uh, you know, the, a way to generate the image that will still look good by moving the image much, much farther away, then you know what, you, the blur image will actually give you a smoother, you know, a, a big picture when you move the image farther away and want people to see the big picture trend rather than the fine, fine details that they may not be able to see once you go to a distance. But in reality, what we use uh, blurring is oftentimes, most often in the uh, down sampling. So when we want to you know, uh, reduce the resolution of our uh, image but want to preserve image quality and not having some kind of uh, abrupt changes across the pixels after we downsample where you know, we use image blurring. And this is actually the first time you're going to be exposed to what we call the uh, you know, pooling layer of machine learning. So basically what we're doing in the uh, in, you know, uh, neural net is that uh, you know the convolution layers and you know the pooling layers. The convolution layers are actually blurring, uh, you know, the image blurring computation, and the pooling layer is downsampling. So, you know, you, 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 once, when we get to the, uh, the uh, neural net, you will see exactly, you know, it's a very, very straightforward application of the image downsampling that we, say, that we routinely use when we process uh, images at Facebook and, uh, you know, YouTube and so on, okay? So these things all have kind of their natural uh, you know, evolution. None of these things are invented uh, yesterday. So in an uh, image blurring computation, every output pixel is going to be the average of pixels around it. Okay? So you, 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 know, you find a little window, and um, you know, you, then you, you, know, you, you take the, all the uh, surrounding pixels, and uh, the window can be bigger, can be smaller. So in this case, we have a nine pixel window for every uh, pixel. So all the, you know, uh, all the eight pixels around a pixel will be used for the average. And um, uh, when we solve differential equations, we use uh, exactly the same thing for solving differential equations, uh, what we call the stencil computation. So uh, you know, we would uh, typically have uh, people say, I have a fourth point stencil in a two-dimensional equation solver which means that you will use the pixels above you, below you, to the left of you, to the right of you, four pixels. Or you can, uh, you know, uh, or five pixels because it also involves yourself. So that's what we call the five point stencil. But then you could also have a nine point stencil which means that you're taking all the points even in the diagonal as well. So that would be a nine sten a point stencil. Sometimes you have a higher order uh, stencil, which means that you're going to take your neighbor's neighbor as well. So you can have two elements in each direction. So that gives you eight, you know, in each, uh, eight total in the x, y, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the 
positive negative x and positive and negative y. So that's eight points plus one. So that's a nine, uh, nine, nine point high order stencil for the computation. So we're now beginning to see that the, you know, the convolution, blurring, and stencil are all the same you know, computation, same type of computation. And uh, so we're going to uh, focus on a simple form here. We're going to take all the eight surrounding pixels and first order, only order one stencil, and average the value with that pixel to give you the final output. So this will give you a kind of a blurred image because all the, all the pixels are now kind of averaged with the neighbors, so it's no longer as sharp. So how do we do the uh, write an image blur kernel? We can assign a thread to generate one output. Okay, each thread will generate one output of the blurred image. So this is what we call the uh, owner's compute rule. And um, uh, if you look at the vector addition, you will see exactly the same pattern. That is, every thread in your code was responsible for generating one output, right? And if we want to have each thread to generate two outputs, four outputs, we just talked about that in the beginning. So still, every output is generated by a particular thread. No other thread will try to mess with it, okay? Only one, for every output, there's a well-defined thread that will generate that output, and that's called the owner, okay? That's called the owner of the output. And the reason why it's so important is because if you have multiple threads trying to generate an output value together, you need to coordinate among them. You, they can mess with each other. So that goes into what we call the atomic operations and so on that we'll be talking about soon. So uh, in MPI programming, in you know, open MP programming, these things are well known that if you begin to have multiple threads to mess with the same output, then you start to have tremendous problems. And that's why, you know what, uh, we have a particular term for this. It's called the owner of the output data, and only the owner of the output data will do the compute. It's the owner compute rule. So here, we, you know, we have the owner's compute rule, where every thread is going to be generating one output value. However, generating the output value requires that thread to go around in the input, right, to go around the pixel in the input and collect all the neighbor values, all the neighbor values, and average them into the output, right? So this is the code that we're going to see here. So this is the first time you're seeing a iterate, you know, loop iteration code in the kernel. So every thread is going to be iterating over um, nine, uh, in this case, in our example, nine, uh, you know, pixels. So the, uh, the, uh, we're going to see, have a blur, a blur row and blur column. And the blur row and blur column is essentially gives you the offset from your current pixel in terms of x and y. So you, know, you go from negative uh, you know, blur size to positive blur size. In, in our simple case here, blur size is 1. Right? You have one neighboring. Uh, you know, the one in the x dimension and one in the y dimension. So we're going to iterate from negative one to zero to one in the uh, x dimension, and then also negative one, zero, one in the y dimension. So together, we're going to have nine iterations of the, 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 inner, the innermost uh, you know, uh, blue body. And then in every iteration, we calculate the row and column index of the input value you're going to be fetching from the memory, and then you will be averaging that, right, into the out outcome. So we calculate the current row and current column, which are the row and column index of the input value you're trying to get, and then you also need to do a test. You need to check whether the input value that you're trying to get is actually within the valid range. Because if your output is at the edge of your image, when you try to fetch the, uh, the neighbor, it may not be there, right? That's the, the, uh, the, the end of the, the image. So this is what we call the ghost cells. Whenever you have these kind of blur computation, stencil computation, convolution com uh, 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 you know, uh, computation, when you try to access the neighboring inputs of a pixel, some of the neighbors may not be there, right? So that's why you need to do a test. So this is 
the picture that you should keep in your mind. When we calculate some output values at the edge, at the corner, and so on, there will be a whole bunch of things that you're trying to access that may not be there. So this is what we call the ghost cells. They're ghosts, okay, they're not real. So um, all the blurring, stencil, and so on image, uh, you know, processing uh, technique, uh, uh, methods all have to deal with these ghost cells. There needs to be a policy. The policy decides what do you do because you don't have those cells. Some of the policy says, I'm going to just uh, use the edge value and repeat the edge value for the, for the ghost cells, right? I, I take the edge value and I say, okay, that's the same as the ghost cell. Some of them just say, I'm going to assume it's zero, okay? I'm going to just assume it's zero. So if you look at the piece of code that we have here, we test whether the input pixel is a ghost cell or not. If it's not a ghost cell, it's real, then you form the linearized index, right? The linearized index and access the input and accumulate it into the output, right? Whereas, and then you, you increase the pixel value by one, right? So you, you, you increase the, the, so in the end, you're gonna divide the total value, okay, the total value by the, uh, you know, the, uh, the number of pixels that you accumulated. So the policy here, there's an implicit policy that we're assuming here. We're assuming that if the ghost cells, if I'm accessing a ghost cell, I simply do not allow the ghost cell to participate in the average. They, so I only add the real cells into there and I divide the number amount, the total amount by the real cells I accumulated. This is one of the possible policies. We could also say, huh, the input value is going, the ghost value is going to be assumed to zero. If that's the case, you don't add anything, but you still increase the number of pixels, right? So, so these policies matter, okay? It will change the output. So this is a particular policy that we're assuming in the code. We will tell you what kind of policy you're going to uh, assume when we, you know, when you process the, uh, these pictures. I saw uh, uh, you first, and then, okay? So this particular kind of feature are working on this? Um, this particular uh, is a one-channel image, exactly right. So, um, in fact, um, what um, you're going to see is that uh, oftentimes um, you can have, you know, Im Im image blurring out of uh, color images and so on. But uh, image blurring is actually very, very frequently used for a uh, grayscale image because, you know, well, we use the grayscale image for a lot of the image recognition work. So, so this is actually a really pop, uh, you know, popular pattern, but you could have a blur for color image as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the question is how expensive are these branches? How expensive are these if then else? The, the truth of the matter is uh, the if then else themselves are not that expensive, okay? So doing these tests and so on, not very expensive. What's really expensive is what happens afterwards. So, uh, you know, by the end of the lecture, you will see, you know, uh, the beginning of that treatment. And we're gonna have like two, three lectures, you know, on that stuff, yes. It's coming up. So the question is, is, does that have to do with the warps and the grouping and so on? That's exactly coming up. Okay. And I saw another question. Yeah. Uh, are we assuming the image is grayscale? In this case, yeah. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the, question, the question is, are we assuming this particular image is grayscale? The answer is yes. For this one, we're assuming grayscale. Yeah. Okay. But you should be able to adapt this to a color image very easily by uh, using the channels, right? Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay, coming up. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's take a look at uh, CUDA thread block. What we know about CUDA thread block so far. Okay, so far. What are the things we know? Um, we know that all the threads in a block execute the same kernel program, right? We wrote a function, kernel function, and we're going to launch the thread grid with that kernel function. So every thread in the grid will be executing exactly the same kernel function, okay? So it's called single program, multiple data, SPMD. Uh, programmers will declare these blocks. You did for vector addition. You assign a block size, 
And then you divide the block size by the total number of uh, data elements you want to process. And if you want to have each thread to process multiple pieces of data, you further divide that uh, you know, to give you the right number of thread blocks. So you know, you know how to do that. And we also know that the blocks can be shaped as 1D, 2D, 3D, right? So uh, you, we, we know this. And um, threads have thread index numbers within the block, and so x, y dimension, and z dimension. And the kernel code uses the thread index and block index to select the work and the data to process, right? So we, all, we know this pretty well by now. And the threads in the same block can share data and synchronize while doing their share of work. We have not covered that yet, but we will be you know, in, uh, today. Not quite today, but uh, on Thursday, you will see more of that. And threads in different blocks cannot cooperate easily. Uh, uh, I should say it cannot co cooperate easily, and each thread uh, block can execute in any order relative to others. The only way they can interact is through atomic operations, but that does not affect the ordering. So you can execute the blocks in any order you want, and they should give you exactly the same result. If you vary the order of executing thread blocks, and you get different results, then you have a problem called a race condition. So you know, we will actually come back to some of these issues uh, you know, when we talk about atomic operations. So now let's begin to talk about what's going on under the hood a little bit. Okay? So um, NVIDIA has produced a large number of generations. In fact, um, uh, this is the 11th year for us to offer ECE 408. It was offered as ECE 498AL a long, long time ago um, in 2008, uh, 2007. So um, I still remember it was January 2017, uh, seven, uh, 2007. And then uh, you know what? We we were you know we had everyone to sign the NDA <laughs> because CUDA was not released uh, public release. So everyone was using an internal version of CUDA. And then, uh, so you know, what, everyone has to sign you know, the, his or her life away to be able to uh, to, to get into this class. So think, you know, so it, it's kind of weird. And then, uh, you know, so in March, the uh, CUDA, CUDA, CUDA toolkit was you know a uh, public release. So everyone uh, got the NDA back. Okay, so I handed back all the NDAs to all the students. So um, so that was the first generation, and uh, it's called G80. And it was the first, you know, the, the CUDA generation GPU. And ever since that, we had a huge number of generations. You know, what the, the next generation was G280, and then uh, and then we have the Fermi, we have the Kepler, we have the Maxwell, we have the Pascal, we have now the Voda, right? So all these are different generation of GPUs. When vendors like Nvidia produce these processors, every generation they will try to make the hardware better. Okay, they uh, they, they need to, you know. Uh, Kind of respond to the market, uh, you know, feedback, and then you know, uh, make things better for the, uh, the their customers. However, when they make things better for the customers, that means that their product, the new generation product, will be different from their previous generation. So there is a principle called uh, you know the forward compatibility. What that means is that if you write a piece of code, and when the uh, company comes with another generation of GPU. In principle, that GPU should run the code correctly, even though you are writing the code for an older generation hardware. And Intel, IBM, NVIDIA, AMD, they all adhere to this principle. Otherwise, they're out of business. Okay? If, if they come up with a piece of hardware that does not run the you know, code that people wrote in the past you know, for their previous products, people will say, OK, go to someone else. Right? So I uh, see a question here. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the, uh, the question is, how about the backward compatibility? I'm actually getting into that. So uh, then uh, the, the, here is an important problem. The important problem is, let's say if you have a new GPU, and the new GPU supports a capability that the old GPUs don't support. Okay? It's a brand new feature, shiny and you know, great. Everyone loves it. But if you write that piece of, you know, you'll write an application based on that feature, it may not be executable on one of the older uh, GPUs. In general, um, you know, the, the, they try to 
deal with that in what we call the emulation mode. You know, so they would uh, try to you know, uh, implement the same feature on the older GPUs through CUDA drivers and you know, compilers and so on. So they will try to, you know, to, to, um, to compile the code in such a way that they will run. Not everything works. So for example, um, for those of you who, you know, who have experience with uh, machine learning using half precision floating point. The half precision floating point implementation for the Pascal generation and on are real hardware. But if you use the half uh, you know, uh, precision floating point for Fermi or Kepler and so on, it's actually done through a compiler library implementation. So you will see that your half precision you know, uh, the performance to be something like much, much lower than using a single precision on the older GPUs. They will still run the code, but the whole point of using half precision is to give you more performance or more, uh, you know, uh, more, more, more uh, energy efficiency. But if you run it on the older GPUs, you'll get exactly the opposite. So this is why the backward compatibility of your application is very, very tricky for all the vendors. Okay, there's no question that um, you know we all have trouble. So that's why you know, Nvidia defines what we call the compute capabilities for GPUs. Essentially, they're telling you, they're telling you for every GPU product, which generation of capability this GPU has. So if you run write your code based on a particular ca capability generation, let's say. Uh, you know, the uh, CUDA 5, uh, the, the uh, sort of the capability, no, it's not CUDA 5, it's the capability uh, generation 5.0. What that means is that if you find another GPU that has less than 5.0 capability, then something will go wrong with your code. It could be much slower, it may not even run, okay? And so, you know, you, you need to be aware. So this is a way to label each GPU and make sure you are, know your code written for a particular capability generation may, not, may or may not run properly on the previous generation. So this is just a warning and it does not mean that you will uh, you know, solve the problem for you but it actually tells you that you're gonna have a problem. So um, just to go back to this a little bit, for capability three, um, 3.0 for Kepler generation, um, you will have you know 16 k byte or 48 k byte of shear memory, which we have not talked about, and uh, but we will talk about very very soon. And then the Maxwell generation increased that to 64 k byte, and the register size you know remained the same. So the, from uh, Kepler generation to uh, you know to uh, Maxwell generation, you can use 260 k bytes of registers in your uh, streaming multiprocessor and then and so on. And then the active blocks in each S, uh, streaming multiprocessor is 16 to 30, uh, improve, increased from 30, uh, 16 to 32. These terms are not introduced yet, but I want to just give you a very, very uh, high level view of, you know, these GPUs will, different, will be different from each other, and the later generation typically will have more allow more numbers of certain resources than the previous generation, okay? So let's go into the specifics. So let's say you wanted to cover, you know, the 76 by 62 pixel picture with 16 by 16 blocks, okay? This is going back to the original, uh, you know, uh, picture. We know a few things. Each thread block is gonna have 256 threads. 16 times 16, 256. We don't know exactly how they're gonna be organized yet in the hardware, but we know that there are 256 threads. And, um, and also we know that some of the threads, you know, will be belong to the right edge, some of the threads will belong to the bottom edge that should not process pixels. Okay, we know, we know these things. So this is the beginning of the, sort of the hardware view of your execution. So, in each GPU, there are hardware units called streaming multiprocessors, and we're gonna call them SMs in, these, uh, you know, in the class. It's very confusing because some people also call shear memory SM, but in this class, we're gonna be using SM strictly for streaming multiprocessors, okay? 
just to avoid the confusion. So we have a number of these streaming multiprocessors. The order of num the number of these streaming multiprocessors vary from generation to generation. In general, you have you know more and more and more of these streaming multiprocessors. And in, if you look just look at one of these GPU chips, if you actually just take a look at the chips, you will see the streaming multiprocessor you know uh, in as kind of units on that chip, and they are roughly the same size or comparable size as a CPU core. So if you buy a CPU from Intel or AMD today, you will see four core, six core, eight core, 16 core. So those are the kind of the equivalent of the streaming multiprocessors in the CPU world, okay? And uh, these are very substantial amount of hardware. And um, uh, so we are, what, at wrong time what happens is that the threads are going to be organized into thread blocks at runtime. OK, so you, you're going to be generating all these thread blocks. And uh, in the previous example, we're going to be generating 5 by 4. So we're going to be generating 20, 20 thread blocks, right? 20 thread blocks at runtime. And these 20 thread blocks are going to be assigned into these streaming multiprocessors. And each thread block can go into one of these. So uh, the driver, this is the job of the driver and the hardware. There's hardware support for these things. So you know, they can be generated very, very quickly. The thread blocks will be generated uh, very quickly and then assigned to these uh, streaming multiprocessors. These streaming multiprocessors, in general, can take anywhere between 1 and 32 thread blocks okay, in the streaming multiprocessor. So this goes back to the number here. Active blocks per SM. For Mac, Kepler is 16, for Maxwell 32. So if you're running a Kepler GPU, each streaming multiprocessor can take up to 16 thread blocks, whereas a uh, Maxwell GPU can take up to 32 thread blocks. So, um, so for Maxwell SM, you know you can take up to uh, you know 32 thread blocks, and then each SM can also take up to a certain number of threads. The threads, these are threads, okay? So Maxwell SMs can take up to 2,048 threads, whereas a Kepler GPU can take up to 1,536 threads. And these are the threads that you sum over all the thread blocks that are assigned to the SM, okay? So let's say, if I have 256 threads in a thread block, and I uh, assign three thread blocks into an SM, and I'm assigning 768 threads into the SM, I'm not fully utilizing all the capabilities because you know, the total capacity of number of threads in that, in that streaming multiprocessor should be 2048. Okay, so there's, you, know, there, there's you, you, you can be calculating what we call the occupancy, because for, as far as the threads are concerned, we're underutilizing the thread capacity of the SM, okay? <coughs> In this case, <coughs> the threads can run concurrently. So the SM will maintain these threads and the, uh, you know, the, the threads and block IDs, and then so that the threads can come in and out of the real execution hardware. And the SM will manage and schedule the thread execution. The fact that you generated 20 thread blocks in that example doesn't mean that all the 20 thread blocks will be all executing in, in, in reality, in parallel in reality. It depends on the number of streaming multiprocessors you have in your, uh, in your hardware and the number of thread blocks each streaming multiprocessor can take in the hardware. Even that, if you have let's say, assigned three thread blocks into an SM, it doesn't mean that all the 768 threads are always executing in together. It's not the case. A lot of the threads are going to be on the bench waiting. And at any point in time, there's only going to be a small subset of threads really running in the real hardware. And this is called the scheduling. Okay, So we're going to uh, go into a little bit more detail of that. So the thread, when it comes to thread scheduling, we go into the concept of warps now. 
And the, this is that question, so I'm answering your work question you know, the, from this slide. So in CUDA, if you look at the programming interface and so on, warps are not part of the CUDA uh, definition. Okay. From the language point of view, from the API point of view, warps don't really exist. But warp is an implementation concept. Yeah, warp, so when we implement a, uh, you know, uh, a GPU, we will take a number of threads and bunch them together into single instruction, multiple data execution. And all the existing NVIDIA GPUs use 32 thread warps, okay? Ever since day one, all the GPUs have been using 32 thread warps, and it has not changed. AMD has produced GPUs based on the concept of wavefront, which is exactly warps, okay? The concept of wavefronts is the same thing. You take a number of you know, the threads and you know, bunch them together in the execution, and AMD has produced 64 thread front wavefronts. Okay, so AMD has used bigger, you know, uh, bigger uh, warp equivalent in their GPU implementation. So these things can vary. And we don't know whether in the future NVIDIA is going to use larger warp sizes or smaller warp sizes. It depends on the technology. It, there are several factors feeding into that uh, decision. So warps are divided, so you take a thread block and you divide them into warps, okay? So warps are always divided from thread blocks. If I have 256 threads in a thread block, 32 threads in a warp, then I have eight warps in my thread block. So every thread block will consist of eight warps, 256 threads, okay? And um, so the warps are divided Fortunately or unfortunately, according to a rule that NVIDIA tells you, okay, NVIDIA actually tells you how they, they uh, divide up the thread block into warps, which is actually quite, uh, quite intuitive. You take thread zero to 30, 31 in a thread block and make that into warp zero, okay? And then you take thread 32 and through thread 63 and you make that into warp one. You said, okay, how about multidimensional, uh, you know, thread blocks? You linearize, row major order, linearize X first, and then Y and Z. You create a linear order, and then you take the first 32, the next 32, and so on. Is it clear? Okay. So for one, two, three dimensions, we know exactly how these warps are divided from the thread blocks. Yes. Oh, you are right. 32 through 63. Ah, bad typo. Okay, so uh, remind, send me an email so that I, I'll remember to correct it. These typos are like cockroaches, okay? They're hard to kill. When you kill them, they come back, okay? Yes? System. Multi ah, uh, I don't. Uh, okay, so the question is, uh, are you uh, assuming that there's a system multiplexer? Yeah, multi-design the same, like the conventional, like same cross generation. Or ah, okay. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, the question is, uh, from generation to generation, are the streaming multiprocessors actually uh, changing or not? The answer is yes. The streaming multiprocessors are actually very, very different from, uh, you know, let's say from um, Kepler to Maxwell to, uh, to Pascal. If you look at the streaming multiprocessors, they're quite different. But for the system level, like a multiplexer, yeah. since you're using 32 threads. Oh, multiprocessors or multiplexers. Ah, we need to talk about what you mean by multiplexer. Let's take it offline. Uh, I think you meant something very specific. Multiplexer to me means that uh, you have you know, multiple inputs and you have a selection. All right, so a max. Like 
Oh, 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 oh. Uh, in this case, yes. So you know, uh, uh, because they all assume the same uh, thread layout. Okay. So uh, the warps are scheduled uh, scheduling units in the SM. That is, when you schedule these threads, everyone in the warp in the same warp as you will have the same fate. Okay. When they when every when a, a thread in the warp executes an addition floating point addition. Everyone else will be executing that floating point addition. Okay, so this is why it's called SIMD, single instruction multiple data. But they'll be executing the same instruction or different. So this creates a little bit of a problem, and we're going to come back to that problem. And I saw a question in the back. Yeah. Uh, asking the, what limits the, the size of the warp? Yeah. So the question is, what limits the size of the warp? So the the size of the warp is limited by uh, two things. One is uh, the typical size of these uh, of these blocks, because uh, if you if the warp is too big, then uh, you know the thread blocks may may not have many warps, right? So uh, the point is that you you need to have a lot of scheduling units that you can choose from. So if you have too big a warp, you may not have enough warps to work with. And the second one is a little bit more subtle. It actually has a lot to do with um, you know uh, divergence because uh, every thread in the warp need to act, do the same thing. So if they need to do different things, we have a divergence problem, and you know, we'll talk about that later. So if you have too big a warp, you will, the, the probability of threads wanting to do different things will increase, right? So that's, then you have increased amount of divergence. And, find, and that applies to both the control and the memory access. So, so we're going to actually talk, talk quite a bit of that, OK? Yeah, yeah. So uh, what if the uh, block does not have um, you know, multiple of 32 block size? So uh, basically, um, this actually has to do with uh, some of the deeper implementation. There's no such thing as blocks without uh, not a multiple of 32. So uh, in the real implementation, if you say, let's say I want a block size of 10. And what happens is it actually gives you 32, but it always turns off 22 of those. So when, when they divide into warps, those 22 will belong to you know, the same warp, and they're always going to have divergence compared to the others. So this is the reason why we tell people when you have a warp uh, block size, not a multiple of 32, you're always going to have a little bit of divergence that you may or may not be aware of. Okay? Yeah, um, the, there are all kinds of uh, proposals, but it all comes down to how expensive it is going to be. Yeah, yeah. Okay, quick, the next question. So even though you always have 0 to 31, the warp 0, and 30 to 63, you still don't have guarantees when the warp is going to be scheduled. Right. Warp 1 be better before warp 2. Yeah, so, so the, the question is, is there any kind of guarantee between the execution order of the warps? No. You cannot guarantee, uh, assume anything. So we're going to continue on Thursday, okay?